there's a, a kind of a dreadful reckoning that happens between the ages of 10 and 20 that we realize, you know, the good guy doesn't always win, that uh, that life is really unfair. And and an awful lot of people go through lives with quiet desperation and aren't happy. And that sometimes bullies are incredibly popular and irritatingly good looking and things like that. So the, the, they're not taught that. And especially I think especially and I go into this in the book. I think especially these days, kids have been given this magical childhood where it's so good and the TV, it's so lifelike and the kind of Disneyland and go to Harry Potter land, whatever it's called, and Legoland. <laughs> the, 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 the height of the childhood experience now is really, really high. And the, uh, the falling from the cliff is much harder fall than maybe my generation where childhood wasn't that great. And so... You know, teenage years, we're, we're, we're still a reckoning with life, but it wasn't quite the hard bang of reality the teenagers are getting today because they have such a magical time as a child. And then it's like, oh, my God, this is really hard. Hi everyone, this is a lovely conversation I had late last Monday evening with Stella O'Malley. Stella is a psychotherapist, author of Fragile, Bullyproof Kids, Cotton Wool Kids and her most recent book is called What Your Teen Is Trying To Tell You. Stella is also the co-host of a podcast called Gender, A Wider Lens, which is in my opinion a must listen for parents of children and teenagers who are exposed to the theories of gender identity ideology. In this chat, we discuss what culture teenagers are growing up in now, how parents are prone to the temptation to send their teenagers to a therapist or counsellor for their behaviour, often forgetting that they themselves were teenagers who once behaved in a similar manner. We also discuss the importance of teenagers experiencing embarrassing or difficult moments and overcoming them in the real world amongst your peers and how this can be a part of learning to cope with life ahead. So please, put your kettle on, get your favourite cuppa, whether it's tea, hot chocolate, coffee, Horlicks, Ovaltine, or any other boiled abomination that definitely is not tea, and enjoy this chat. Let me know your thoughts in the comments, and please don't forget to like and subscribe to my channel to keep up to date with the latest content. Thank you. Let's begin. Just before we... Oh, sorry. I thought I've done that already. We're on. We're on. We're on. Okay. We're Hi, on. Stella. Let's go, Bertie. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to... I want to ask you what your book is about because you've got a new book coming out haven't you I do so my book is called what your teen is trying to tell you and I wrote it it was like I've written a few books before but this one is probably the one closest to my heart because this one is about teenagers and I was a demonic teenager I was a very I was a very distressed teenager and I wrote this book Number one, thinking of those distressed teens who were lost and lonely and crazy and hard to reach and hard to help. And I see a lot of them in my clinic, in my work as a psychotherapist. But I realized that these days it's different, obviously, you know, different generations, different things. And these days, an awful lot of kids, they are they are so close to their parents in childhood and they are so it's so fast that they're sent to the professionals and the idea of the book is to help parents help their teens because rather than just sending them to somebody like me which which can be very helpful but it can also kind of create a triangle where there's a therapist who's saving them there's a child who feels like kind of the victim and there's the parent who's the persecutor and that's a really bad scenario and what should be happening is the parents should be leaning into the child and the teenager and kind of helping them out in whatever clunky way we do as parents because everything we do is wrong so yeah yeah whatever you still (laughs) should be leaning in but instead because we've professionalized and pathologized so many emotional problems parents are bringing the professionals too fast too soon and actually the child thinks there's something wrong with me I'm being sent to the professional the parent feels less connected because it's all about the teenager and the and the therapist 
and everybody has been a little bit weakened. Well, I'd rather if there was an idea of, first of all, you might, the parent might read up about it. Maybe they read my book, maybe they go on YouTube, maybe they do whatever, read up about it. You know what I mean? And then they might go to therapy themselves to help, not because there's anything wrong with the parents, but because the therapist could help the parent help the child, if you follow me, kind of like in a coaching way. Maybe they need more authority. Maybe they need to put down more rules. Maybe they need more gentleness. I don't know what they need, but they get a therapist to help them. And then as a last resort, you send the teenager to therapy rather than, oh, they're distressed, whack them off to therapy. Has your therapist not fixed you yet? Because that's how the kids, they come in, they think there's something wrong with me. I'm being sent to the profession. You're going to fix me, apparently. And like, honestly, it's it's I, I work well with them, but I feel sorry for them because they feel like they've been told you're wrong. You, you, you've got something wrong with you. We'll sort this out in therapy and then you'll be all right. And that's that's really you know what it, do you know what it sounds like to me? Sorry, I'm not I don't mean to laugh at it in the, mm. you know, I don't mean to trivialize it, but it sounds to me like we're sort of like sanitizing teenagers you know like getting like when you do, use hand gel to kill all the germs let's get all the all the wrong bits like, let's iron them out and make them perfect mm -hmm. and these are coming from people that were probably demonic teenagers themselves right i know and when <laughs> i bring this up i remember one guy right and he was such a lovely loving father and he was talking to me about his teenager and he was like he's driving me mental and at one point i just suddenly just got a smell and i says you like as a teenager he goes oh my god <laughs> and he told me about how his mom was down at the police station every day that there was this there was that and, so. and i was like it's amazing you've never brought that up to me <laughs> all the months <laughs> we've been talking about your child you've never once thought and he goes well i know but but <laughs> he really hadn't connected that there's a, a kind of a dreadful reckoning that happens between the ages of 10 and 20 that we realize, you know, the good guy doesn't always win, that uh, that life is really unfair. That and scary. And, and an awful lot of people go through lives with quiet desperation and aren't happy. And that sometimes bullies are incredibly popular and irritatingly good looking. And things like that, the, 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 they're not taught that. And especially, I think especially, and I go into this in the book, I think especially these days, kids have been given this magical childhood where it's so good and the TV, it's so lifelike and the kind of Disneyland and go to Harry Potter land, whatever it's called, and Legoland. <laughs> the, 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 the height of the childhood experience now is really, really high. And the, uh, the falling from the cliff is much harder fall than maybe my generation, where childhood wasn't that great. And so... You know, teenage years, we're, we're still a reckoning with life, but it wasn't quite the hard bang of reality the teenagers are getting today because they have such a magical time as a child. And then it's like, oh, my God, this is really hard. Well, I think the the reality slapping you in the face, in the face thing, I think that comes down to the fact that, like, I I grew up when I was a teenager, I didn't really get social media or anything till I was about 17 or 18. So I managed to get the the first part of being a teenager yeah. in before the internet Key. and I think that that was good for me because I got to deal with reality every day nowadays they don't have to kids can grow up in whatever world they want online like just YouTube Disney Channel everything well, it's not called Disney Channel anymore is it it's the uh, app whatever I don't know <laughs> <Who cares? laughs> it'll be called something else tomorrow but, but um I I think you're right and I think what what an awful lot of kids are doing nowadays is they're they're retreating into the, the kind of the magical world of online that like lets them kind of delay the hard, difficult vulnerability of, you know, fancying somebody and maybe smiling at them or holding hands or fumbling. Oh, my God. The first kiss. And it's so hard. And everybody had to go through it. And even it's me the best stuff as well. Yeah. It's the stuff that like all the number one songs are written about all the poems all the, books, all the best films all the art I know it's fabulous but it's awful as well and it's very vulnerable making and I think and I think it's amazing it's very this is heaven this is hell it's very it's you know it's both but I think um an awful lot of teenagers just find it that there's a brilliant replacement in their bedroom on the computer 
And just like I remember, like loads of different teenagers telling me over the years, oh, no, my online friends are better. My life is better. Sex is better. The fun is better. You don't understand, Stella. And I used to look at them going, I find this very hard to believe. Then COVID happened and I went, I found out. No, it's not true. Your your life isn't better. Your socialising isn't better. Having a coffee with your friend is not as good. It's just you know what? It's imperative. It's imperative because yeah. um, like whenever I am struggling a little bit, like if I'm struggling just in general, the one thing that is usually missing from my day is seeing somebody face to face and having a coffee with them. It, it's because I've spent, because my fellas at work and I'm just hunkered down doing my art all day. And then I go to the gym and I go to the gym at a time when nobody's there. And then I come back and they still, I haven't seen anybody. And I was like, oh shit, I, I don't see anybody all day. That's why I'm struggling. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm like, I have to go to the gym when people are there and I have to say hello to people and look them in the face. And it makes a difference, even just yeah. that little interaction. So I'm like, it's so important to have this face-to-face because there are other things that are happening. It's not just what we're saying to each other. I still and there's haven't feelings figured that out. But there, there's something <laughs> in it. Like, I agree with you wholeheartedly, but there's something about the physical exchange that gives yes. people heart. And yes. I, I'm not sure what that is. I live in the middle of a main street, so I I can easily access it in a mild way. That kind of how you, do you know what I mean? Which is really good for me because I live like you. I live a kind of solitary life in my work and stuff like that. But it's so important for, and I don't, I don't like saying the soul because I'm not religious, but it's like there's something. There's something. Yeah. And And those kids don't know it. They, they're telling me, no, 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 you don't understand. It's as good. And I'm like, it's not. It's not. They they told me the sex is as good. And I'm like, it's not. You don't know. It's almost like you're fighting your nature because I'm somebody who loves my own company. I love it. I just, I'll hang around myself all the time. I'll just do whatever. I can just sit around drink tea by myself. I won't say a word to anybody, but that, it does affect me and that's against my will me that's too. you know like when you get a cold and you're like oh for fuck's sake I've been eating all the right things I've been drinking yeah. I've been going to the gym yeah. I should not get I should not be getting a cold but you are getting a cold because you've you you know you, your immune system's down or something something's up yeah. and um yeah it's kind of I don't know if that's a good analogy but it affects you without you wanting it to you don't get a choice yeah it's inevitably coming because yeah i don't think it's like having a cold it's like not eating the right stuff and getting the cold or something like that you, you know what i mean yeah i'll have to think about that one <laughs> <laughs> yeah but i think i do think that they have an option to retreat into a kind of almost as good as life and they take it and they pretend them to themselves that it's better and the reason why it's because it doesn't make them vulnerable. It doesn't make them scared. It doesn't make them frightened. So they think it's better. It's comfortable. And isn't there, you know, there's there's a lot written about beware of the comfortable, because if you stay in the comfortable, you're basically staying in your sitting room on the couch, eating pizza, doing very little. Yeah. You know what I mean? So this whole comfortable and those kids, they're they're saying they're, they're kind of using kind of often conditions that they've been kind of there's been a diagnosis creep, which I get into in the book where you know, conditions have been diagnosed very quickly, very easily. And then these kids, a lot of them feel like there's something specially wrong with me. My anxiety means I can't go out. My anxiety means I can't go to school. School refusal is massive these days where they're lovely kids. They work hard. They do well in their exams, but they don't go to school. And it's like they're just retreating, retreating from life and retreating from anything that's difficult. So if the family goes out for, you know, something to eat, they won't order. The man will order for them. Or, do you know what I mean? It's kind of always staying in the safe and afraid to go out. And so they use this kind of condition that they might have been diagnosed with. And frankly, that's a subjective diagnosis that depends on the doctor who's giving it. And people don't realize this. This isn't a kind of a blood test. It's a kind of it's, it's a form and how you answer your questions. And then they think there's something especially wrong with me. I am not feeling what everybody else is feeling. They think other people find it easy to smile at the, the boy they fancy. But I'm special. I don't. And it's like, no, 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 no. We all find it <laughs> awful. You, yeah. you know, so I'm try- this, this idea that they don't know the pain involved of being a teenager. And it's a very painful time. I, I do think it it's is. a 
people. Though. I really do, you know, but they think that it shouldn't be. They don't realize these teenagers often don't realize, no, no, this is part of the package of between 10 and 20. This is on the menu. And that's a kind of a shock to them. And they're like, oh, no, others are flying through, living their best life. And I'm like, they aren't. They're whole. They aren't. No. And it's interesting to me, you said about them pulling away from school. So they'd rather, is it they're they're doing their work from home? Yeah. That's interesting. So that must have been um, exploding from the COVID thing because going to school is, oh, is it not? It's huge. It's huge. Yeah. Oh, it's huge in general. Yeah. It was, oh, it was like always... Going to school is so important, in, in not just for education, I but I mean for your social life. But I, like You learn how to deal with so much stuff oh. just by like, if you've had a bad day at school, you've got to go in the next day and you've got to suck it up. I mean, as you were telling me that, I, was, I just had all of my worst memories come oh, did you? and one of them sticks out there was this boy I really liked oh my god I used to like look at him from across the classroom and then be like uh, I'm not looking at him and we were doing PE this was in junior school but this was just before we went to secondary school so we were all starting to sort of yeah. the, the puberty is getting ready it's, it's bubbling yeah. underneath and um we we were playing rounders and I was running because I had to catch the ball. So I was running around this field and I was looking at the ball and I didn't realise he was so close to me. I ran into him, basically knocked him out. I <laughs> fell on top of him. him. Yeah, I <laughs> fell on top of him. And guess what else happened at the exact same time? A bird shit on my hand. Okay. Which is so humiliating. It was the worst thing. I think I might have cried. I might have cried. I'm but sorry. I still had to. I had to go and clean my hand up, um, and I had to go back to class, and I had to go back to school, and you have to get on with it. And the, but yeah. things like that, I laugh at it now. But I'm mortified at the time. It stayed with me. Obviously, it's burned itself in my brain somewhere. I know. And but I, teenagers like they're they're yeah. going to lose out on that if they don't. They are well. School refusal is huge, and it's not being said. And that's quite and one of the reasons I I was so keen about writing this book was I wanted to break the taboo. When the toddler is screaming in the mar- supermarket, all the parents laugh and they say, "Oh, he made a show of me, and it was mortifying, and we're all cool." When they're six and they behave badly, we kind of you know, oh, it's terrible, and it's quite open. We say, "Oh, children, they'd make a show of you." Then at the teenage years, it gets much more complicated because they look like they're fully formed. They can speak like we can. They actually only have a half formed brain. It's not fully formed until they're 25. But they look I often think it's like an unmade cake that you look inside the oven and it looks perfect. Then you open it up and it's a mush. But that's what they are. They look perfect. A mush of magic going on in fairness to them. And um, I think teenage uh, parents tend to be secretive about their their teenagers craziness and so they and the, some of the teenagers behave really badly and they don't tell anybody because they're embarrassed they're mortified and they there's a taboo about it so it's kind of oh what do they get in their results is what people talk about and whether they play music and stuff we don't actually say it was mad last night i saw madness you know what i mean and um School refusal is one of those things that so many parents don't talk about. You know, I was talking to a parent the other day just out and I was telling her about my book and she said, my child, my son, she said, went to secondary school for one day in the whole. I know. I was like, one day. And she was like, one day. She said, we drove up to that school and we drove back. And we went up and back and there was people coming out to us and there was the law coming out to us and it was this, it was that, it was those that we could not get that child into that school. Wow. I know. Like the pain involved in that would have been huge and it would have been secret. Do you know what yeah. I mean? There's not, not much being said. And it's all like there's a massive array of entertainment offered in the bedroom that they don't have to go out. They just don't have... The- yeah, this is really bad. I'm just sorry I'm interrupting. We were, before pandemic and everything, we were on tour and my partner's a musician. So we were getting ready to do a gig and on the way to the gig, I saw a massive billboard and it was like literally outside the venue he was going to play. And on the billboard, I think it might have been a Netflix advert or something mm-hmm. like that. But it just said, 
it said something like a million reasons to stay indoors tonight and I went well that's not the advert you want outside your gig is it like you want people to come out you know but that is everywhere that is everywhere and it, and it's true you have got a million reasons to stay indoors tonight I don't think we've ever had so much to stay in I'd say like you know I just think when I was a kid TV was really boring like you know what I mean like yeah you watch the odd thing but now you could be laughing and entertained all day, every day. And I see it with my own kids. My teenage girl has a boyfriend and they just sit watching television. <laughs> okay, it's Netflix or whatever it is they're watching. <laughs> but it's, or video games, whatever it is. But it's all inside. And you just think, God, that's boring. Wouldn't you think there'd be more going on? Like, you know what I mean? There isn't. I don't know. I kind of feel like I grew up a little bit in between it because I stayed yeah. in a lot but I stayed in a lot as a teenager because I went to school a little bit further away. So I couldn't really socialise where I lived because I didn't go to school with everyone where I lived. That's and I think that's because I'm deaf. So I went to a different school. So I stayed in a lot, but I hated it. It was oh. boring. So was like, yeah. I used to do things like go to the library and like went out as many books as I could because you get like the little stamps and I'd read all the books and then go back to the library. And just, I, I just read a lot. I read so many books and I just did that, but as a teenager, yeah, yeah, that's Surprise. what I did I until I got, yeah, yeah, until I got like slightly older, and then I started going out in the town where I went to school because that's where all my friends were. But initially, for the first few years, like maybe thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, even, I was just hitting the library, reading books, wow. drawing pictures, doing all that sort of stuff. I didn't really do much. It was, like, but it was incredibly boring. Yeah, boring, but a parent's dream. But I think. Um, one of the issues around this, and I, I kind of go into it in my book, I certainly touch on it, is that back in the day there was youth clubs and discos and kind of there was an awful lot of kind of youth event type things. And a lot of them have been kind of effectively health and safety out. Yeah, yeah, you know that I mean? happened with me. So sorry to interrupt. So by the time no. I was 16 or 17, I was in the park drinking white lightning. That's yeah. what we did. Yeah. listen to Blink-182 on a Walkman CD yeah. and I would try and figure out how I can snog a boy. That's basically what I did. But nowadays, it's not that, is it? They're, they're not going out and doing that, are they? They're not going out. No, they're, they're much more likely to be in, in their own bedroom messaging the fella they like, swapping photos with the fella they like. You know what I mean? And... Uh, a lot of that, an awful lot of sexual transaction, but I don't think it's as good. No, of course are, not. It's rubbish. I remember in school, one yeah. boy told us about how he was doing phone sex, and I didn't know what that was. So I was like, yeah. it's phone sex, and he just went, don't bother. It's not, it's not any good. <laughs> no, okay. <laughs> I wonder where he is now. But yeah, no, that's lovely that he said that, because these days they basically think they're going out They've only had phone sex. They've only had message sex, if you follow me. And it's transactional. It's very much you send me and then I'll send you. And if you betray me, I'll betray you. And it's 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 very far from the kind of, you know, somebody touching your hand and then, you know, a kiss and a fumble and in the park or whatever. You know, and I, I you know, I go into the stats around that, like the, the, the age of people having sex is much higher, like it's they're physical sex i'm talking about real sex as so much getting drunk smoking taking drugs all of those things which back in the day everybody was trying to stop teenagers from doing but they've stopped but what how they've stopped is in a very sad anxious way now i'm not sending them all off to, to take acid but i am <laughs> saying there has to be something had there has to be a reckoning there has to be a realization there has to be there has something. to be um some rituals and traditions that only teenagers participate in right healthy ones not white yeah. lightning in the local park yeah. but healthy ones and I, I don't know what that is I, I i don't think we've figured out and i go into it in quite a lot of detail and kind of challenging kind of reminding parents listen between 10 and 20 we become sexual beings between 10 and 20 we become mature beings who end up having a drink and uh, like you know maybe taking drugs or whatever else and we do an awful lot of things the idea of adolescence is to break the spell of childhood and to look forward to adult life 
And therefore, if you if you're so frightened, you don't want to go out, you don't want to meet your mates, you don't want to have sex with anybody because you're too scared and you um, don't want to take a drink because you feel out of control. And that's the reason why they don't want to take a drink, etc. You know, you could apply that to anything. Then you're going to have somebody who doesn't want to grow up and they don't. They don't want to grow up. They'd rather yeah, they don't want to break the spell of childhood. And that's what Peter Pan was about, wasn't it? Yeah. And yeah, I remember talking to you about that in oh, Messenger, yeah, I think, that's because right. that's like quite a dark story. Like Peter Pan tried to like lure all these other kids into going to Neverland with him so that they would forget their parents and forget their life and just stay in this fantasy of being a child forever. But it was like really violent. It was really brutal. It was just, and then, yeah, it's a, sorry, I don't mean to distract. No, no, keep going, it's, keep going. Yeah. it's a really interesting story to me because Wendy's the one that remembered and so she was saying, no, you know, she initially she becomes like the mother of the boys in Neverland, doesn't she? Yeah. And she was saying, um, you know, she remembers home and, and she would tell the boys about it because the lock boys forgot. But yeah. when they when she eventually managed to talk them into going back and they did stay behind, I think she was the only one that remembered Neverland as well afterwards. Oh. So when the boys actually, the, the more, I think the more of the story is that, you that growing up is good like you have to grow up to live your life you don't want to be stuck does that make sense and Peter Pan's yeah. stuck and he was like that I don't know if you're allowed to say it but I'll just say it he's like crazy Peter Pan's crazy he's a nah and he's <laughs> like to say that. <laughs> he's not yeah. sue us. and <laughs> and um it's I I personally think it's insidious but it was one of my favorite stories when I was a kid maybe I related to it I mean I didn't no I think well, a lot of kids don't want to break that no, spell I, I well there's a few things I think I think it's a very powerful story I think that's what was so good for example about a lot of children's stories was that we were processing if you kept and imagine if you kept on reverting to that story there was something about it that was compelling psychology would tell us that you were working through something and it was saying something to you and you were yeah. working through it and you go back well, to it exactly. Do you get yeah because you got the hook is scared of the crocodile with the clock but that is your life running out that is the clock ticking oh on God. your life and I really got into Peter Pan because that film came out on VHS um, when I was in hospital. So I had an operation on my throat and it all went crazy. I was accidentally overdosed on morphine. All this stuff happened. And I got given the VHS while I was off my head. I was absolutely out of it. Um, and oh. it had the, the uh, what I loved about what it as well. A seven. I think okay. I was seven. Yeah. And uh, I think seven is a good age as well. It's, there's something about seven for me. But there was this sticker on it, and it was like the Great Ormond Street sticker. So I was really proud that money from this VHS went to other kids that were in hospitals and stuff. And then I watched it, and I watched it on loop. And it's all I remember when I was off my head on morphine. Um, but it stuck with me. And there's something about it. And I think it's because when you go for something like an operation and it goes wrong and things like that, and you're a child and you don't understand life and death, this is a really good story. Um, and originally, I don't know if you know about the author, his mum lost a child. That was his brother. His brother died and his brother was a little bit older than him, I think, when he was a kid. And that story was supposed to be about him. So it is about death and it's about death for children. You know, it's it's very. I think people should look into it. People should definitely listen to that story. Oh, yeah. And and weirdly enough, I go into the concept of Peter Pan syndrome in the book, and just talking about it because it's a thing these days. These kids don't want to grow up. They haven't been turned on to adulthood. They ha they don't look forward to freedom. They just think it's just an admin nightmare. Adulthood. They think it's boring. <laughs> they want to stay in their bedrooms in a kind of a, a frozen state if you follow me, and stay in make-believe. And they have this extraordinary way of saying the, the society has messed up mental health so that young people with mental health problems can say, stop pushing me. You know what I mean? Even when it's good to gently nudge them along, they're like, stop. And they can brandish their, their kind of mental health with like a shield. And they don't know they're doing it. They're not doing it manipulatively. They're doing it instinctively like, stop pushing me. And it's it's very unfortunate for their mental health. It's not good for them. And we've sold that to teenagers. We, you know, yes. society has sold that to teenagers. It's not that teenagers have suddenly become these frightened, scared, anxious people. 
society has created these frightened, scared, anxious teenagers. And the, in your book, have you addressed, like, is the, I don't know if this is a thing, so you tell me and tell me if you've addressed it, the idea of parents being too scared to push their kids as well. I certainly do. <laughs> I certainly do because it's massive. So one of the biggest things about the book, do you remember I talked about right at the beginning, I said helping parents help their teenagers, helping parents feel empowered enough to go in themselves rather than calling in the professionals, helping parents kind of gather their strength and say no. And yet, because so many parents would say to me, OK, I'll do all that. How do I do it without a fight? And I'm like, there's going to be killings, huge fights. <laughs> Forget it. Massive fights. But you kind of have to do it because it's, it's necessary, if you follow me, to hold your authority. And they're like, oh. <laughs> because yeah, to finish, it, like, fights are scary. But like, if, for, for people like I, I, in my life, have quite often wanted to avoid confrontation. So yes. naturally, I'm, I'm an avoider. But I've had to learn to deal with confrontation, as mm -hmm. you probably noticed. I, I deal with know. it all the time now, so I'm a bit, bit good at it. But the thing is, there is it is about how you resolve conflict, right? Yeah. So kids need to learn how to resolve conflict. Otherwise, they go into adulthood trying to avoid it and being like defensive and going on the attack if they feel like they're being in, intruded on in an argument or something. Yeah. So they, they don't know how to handle anything, right? Yeah. And it's our job. And it's, you know, you know, I, I do talk about a lot about the tasks of adolescents. And I'm going to go back to what you said about the parents and the audience because it's a big, big. Oh, deal. yeah. But um, the tasks of adolescents, imagine a toddler has to learn how to, I don't know, eat and run or whatever. And then the early childhood, they have to learn how to tie their laces and ride a bike. And they all have tasks, developmental milestones to get through. Well, adolescents have to learn how to handle conflict, learn how to handle friendships, learn how to handle friendship difficulties, learn how to handle depth, learn how to handle all these complex scenarios that at 10 you didn't know and by 20 you kind of should know. We and Because I go for them as these are developmental milestones, these are tasks that they have to work through, it kind of makes the, the, the adult realise you can't do it for them. If you just push them out of the way and start tying their legs, they'll never learn it. So they have to have the difficulty of falling off the bike. They have to have the kind of problems if they're going to learn. And so many parents are, and I think yet again, I'd lay so much of the blame at my own industry's door, the mental health industry, who are, I think have really not covered themselves in glory in many different ways. But <laughs> um, the parents have been taught to be so frightened of mental health that they can't have a fight with their kids, that they're frozen in the face of tears. They're frightened of their child's distress. They're freaked out when their child is freaking out. And they just, they're so terrified. They're afraid to lay down a lot. They're afraid to say, no, you can't. No, I'm taking your phone off you. They're, they're so frightened. And I think they've been made frightened by society that has just bent their ear about mental health. And I'm not saying there isn't mental health problems. I'm saying we've done it wrong. Yeah, and and people are focusing a lot on their emotions in the moment, and I, I I'll say that because we babysit yeah. our nieces and nephews, and one of my nephews is a handful. He is like Tasmanian devil, but really cute. Mm. And my partner told him off at one point because he'd been told not to do this thing, and he did this thing, yeah. and my partner said, "No, you can't do this yeah. thing." And he went and sat on the bottom of the stairs and cried, and my partner was like proper heartbroken and he was I said well, you've got to go and talk to him and he went to talk to him and my partner was all like and I just took control of the situation and I just went to my nephew mm -hmm. I went you know what you did was wrong yeah okay and you know you said sorry he did say sorry and do you want a hot chocolate let's go and have a hot chocolate right because that's what we were gonna do next anyway but what I was trying to show my partner not that I'm an expert because I don't have kids but I was just trying to show him we've got to move on. Yeah, It can't be uh, he's been told off, now he's crying on the stairs and we're going to have this whole scene about him crying on the stairs. It's, he knows he did something wrong. He said, sorry, let's go. Brilliant. That's it. And you, you know, know what? what I mean? But my, yeah. my partner was like proper hurting because he yeah. didn't want to make his nephew cry and all this stuff. And I was like, nope, he's six. He'll get over it. It's fine. Yeah. Look, And five minutes later, he was putting all the marshmallows in his hot chocolate after I told him not to. So, you know. Here we go again. <laughs> <laughs> and we're off. <laughs>
Yeah, but what you what you highlight there is really important. One is that this comes naturally to some people, not very many, and you're one of them, who just kind of instinctively realizes, no, 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 we don't have to we don't have to fold. We don't have to make a big deal. We just need to stand strong and move on. And yeah. some people just get that around kids. They just understand it almost like some people are just good, throw them a ball and they know they can handle a ball. If you follow me, some people just have that emotional kind of intelligence. They get it. And an awful lot of people don't. And that's fair enough. And I'm kind of very into the fact you're all right. Like, you know, to imagine if you if your partner and stuff, it's like, yeah, yeah, you're folding. And all you have to do be aware of is you're freaking out. You know, you're you're losing it. And realize <laughs> just because they're losing it. I have this phrase in the book, a big emotion doesn't have to be met with a big emotion. Just because yes. they've got it, yeah. Just because they've got a big emotion doesn't mean you have to go, ah Oh my god, all of his emotions are enormous. He's such a little boy and he's got like all these emotions. Yeah. Yeah, but I try to kind of help out the parents for whom it doesn't come naturally. And I would be one of those who it doesn't come naturally. I have a good understanding of psychology, but I'm very quick to anger. I'm I'm very fast and stuff. I'm not what you would usually put in front of children. I'm way too good. (laughs) Wow, wow. I'm inconsistent. I'm all sorts of things that are wrong. But because of that, I understand the psychology behind different things. I've learned about it. I've figured it out. And I've realized through learning like somebody who learned how to handle a ball, if you follow me, and learned how, you know, the, do you know what I mean? Well, it might have come more naturally to you. It's easier for me to teach it because I'm like, yeah, don't lose it. I know how you could be losing it. I would be you. And this is why you don't. And this is why you have to walk the hell away before you start going, oh, I'm crying with you. <laughs> yeah, and that's what he was doing. I yeah. was like, oh, my God, now I'm going to have two of them crying. Yeah, yeah, and totally. I can't have this. This is not on. Like, let's just all move well, on. That's been, over. <laughs> that's been replicated. And what's really frightening is the the soft puddle of tears of your partner is the one who's ruling the roost these days very often in parenting because there's a very um, inappropriate mental health industry, which is kind of selling this crap. And it's not helping and it's not helping parents and it's not helping children. This isn't making for happier kids. It's making for an undisciplined kind of mess unfolding where everybody's bawling. And the more instinctively kind of kind of move it on. This is this is all a bit over the top. Yeah, we don't need to be hung yeah, up on it. It's fine. Yeah. Like, you know. It's like Greek opera here. Um, <laughs> I've been told they're hard and it's it, it's not true and it's not helping kids it's really not helping kids but. no and the thing is like I've I've told my nephew off before as well and he also this when I told him off also went and sat on the stairs and cried and then we sorted that out in two mm. seconds I did the same thing but I'm not as easily like I don't like that he's crying but I'm not I'm not gonna be upset the way my partner is but he loves us we're his favourite, yeah. like his favourites. Yeah, yeah. I shouldn't He's say that in case my well family listen, but we are his favourites. And then, it, but it is because he knows where he stands with us, especially yeah. like when he's in our house, he's in our environment. I'll be like, no, in our house, you don't, you know, chuck your dinner at yeah. people and stuff like that. You don't drop it on the floor, or whatever. And he knows where he stands with us, and I think that's nice for kids. They want to know. They want that. that. Them. Yeah. It settles them. And it's the same for teenagers. We think that they're almost adults. They're so far from almost adults. They're all over the place. Their emotions are really high. Their emotional brain is much more developed than their logical, reasonable brain. They're really, really, as far as a deck of cards, they're playing with half a deck and we're playing with a full deck. (laughs) They're losing it about various things. And our job is not to lose it with them. Our job is to think, yeah, you're losing it now. I'm backing out. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> because we're afraid of the depth of her emotion. I know, I know people listening will be saying, oh, yeah, but she's self-harming and she's this. And I know anxiety episodes, panic. I know how awful it can ge- get. And that's something that we do have to confront. But in the moment, there isn't much point in the parent getting in to the madness with them. Generally, it's more helpful to think this has kind of gone really wrong. I'm going to leave you to it in the nicest possible way. And you're really distressed. I'm not going to make you worse. I'll be back in a few minutes. 
Do you know what I mean? What's the point in going in? Ah, there are. It's yeah, going- they'll react. I was a teenager once, I remember. Sort of yeah. like if anybody came in and tried to tell me to do something while I'm distressed or tried to tell me how, how they, they think it's going to be, or if they, if they come in with their stress about me being stressed while I'm stressed, yes. I'm reacting to that. It's like chucking fuel on a fire. What are you doing? Yeah. But, but, but I don't know. I'm not a parent, so I don't know that like, you're, you've written a book about this stuff, so... You're my expert tonight. Yeah, yeah. This whole I'm not a parent, so the parents, those non-parents aren't allowed to comment on everything. I would like to blow that apart. Yeah, you can. We all know what it's like to be a human. Yeah, I know what it's like to be a teenager, but I don't know what it's like to have a teenager in 2020. Although my nieces and nephews are coming up to that age. Some of them are. It's so, stressful. you know. I think, I think being a teenager at the moment, I think it's, I think being a kid is a joy. I think it's a lot. Mm-hmm. I don't know if children have ever had such a good time. They've certainly, nope. yeah, they really do. But being a teenager, it's rotten these days. It's pretty depressing. I, I wish it wasn't, but it, it feels really pretty boring. An awful lot of distraction, very little fun. You yeah, know, I, me and my partner, are like, we've been a little bit like, worried because some of our nieces and nephews are about to be teenagers but we kind of said like what we'll do if one of his sisters gives oh, yeah. us a call and says oh so and so is like being a pain in the ass today bring them around there we're going to put them to work we're going to make them do things for us like they can package yeah. all my stickers up and post them for me they can do whatever you know yeah. well maybe not some of my stickers because they're rude but <laughs> you know what I mean like yeah. they can, they can well, come around and do some work with us or you know they've got to get out and do that, something physical yeah, that's one of the things we've lost. Is uh, I think adolescents have lost a lot in the last twenty or so years, and um, I don't think it's benefited them. What you know, one of the things that they've lost is the kind of um, ability to go to work in a small way. There's not; it's so difficult to get a job under sixteen or so because um, of labour laws. And I know it's great. I don't want to put children up chimneys. <laughs> Do you know, I know. <laughs> The empowerment of working and getting a few quid, it's really powerful. Yep. I was a babysitter and yeah. I and I um I had a friend whose mum let me clean her house and do her garden for her. Yeah. And yeah, and I was a babysitter. So that was pretty good. Like I was like fourteen at the time. It's very empowering. It's made you feel big and proud and able and competent. And an awful lot now, babysitting, they've been done by professionals. Everything's been done by professionals. They don't get in. The teenagers, some of them do, and I'm sure people will write in saying, oh, my kid is not delight for them. But an awful lot of teenagers haven't had a job by the time they're 18. They haven't had that feeling of, I worked hard, I was really good at it, and I got well paid. Well, kids love it, because like at Christmas this year, sorry, I keep telling you my story, but <laughs> at Christmas this year, um, we didn't have like tons of money to get kids Christmas presents. So what we did was we got them a series of really small presents that would you... Yeah things that go together like maybe some paints and maybe a thing to paint and I hand drew um activity books for each one of the children and I drew like a cartoon of them on the front of the book and I printed them all off at home and I put activities in for each one of the kids like age appropriate for the child and each time they completed an activity they would get another small Christmas present from us and the kids loved it because they had to work for it yeah, yeah, yeah. and they actually afterwards said that they enjoyed the activities more than the presents <laughs> but, <laughs> but it is true that they do want to work for stuff they want to achieve they yeah. want to they want to yeah. do something that takes time and they have to sit down and do it or go out and do it or whatever yeah and all these kids, we've got so obsessed with education and school. Some kids thrive in it, and a lot of kids are just going, I'm bored, I don't like it, it's boring, it's not stimulating, and I'd be happier if I was working. And those kids aren't given the opportunity. It's school, school, education, education, education. We've just got this obsession <laughs> with our education, which is fine. Certainly, we've got a much better education. But there's an awful lot of very kind of this is boring. I don't want to be older. I don't like it. I, I, I don't have any sense of pride in life. I'm I'm bored and I just want to distract myself on YouTube or TikTok because I'm bored. Do you know what yeah. I mean? That's sad. And do you think kids are worried about growing up and getting older as well because they don't know what they want to be and they don't yeah. know what they want to do That's and they're told that they do need to know, aren't they? Because well, when I was a kid, 
I was like, it was pretty much drilled into me in secondary school before I left that I have to know what I'm doing and I have to go to college and I have to do all this. Otherwise I'm going to be like homeless. And I was like, so stressed out about it because I knew I wanted to be an artist, but I also had people in my life telling me I couldn't do that. I can't be an artist. I've got to be like, got to go and do something. The world tells artists they can't be an artist. It's so demoralizing. I remember my friend was a born artist. She's just so talented and like her family just it's hard to explain when you're an art. Well, you know it. It's it's this it's it's so pernicious because it's so subtle. It's just like, well, you're a waster if you're going to be an artist, not really going to be an artist. It's it's kind of yeah. with a smile. And that's a but, um, yeah. And people even to this day, people ask me what I do and I say I'm an artist and they're just sort of like, no, what's your real job? And I'm like, no, this is my real job. But can I go back to this thing? I think yes. a few things have happened and I, I do a chapter on kind of identity and purpose and I go into gender a bit on it and stuff because I can see something has happened that really when I was a kid, you know, you were like you, it was a kind of expectation of you're going to do, get a job, really important. You're going to pick it early and you're going to either be a success or not. And it was quite limited, really, what you were going to be. It was, you know, there was there was not, not that many jobs that you could be, maybe 40 or 50. But you know what I mean? There wasn't that many choices. Now there's something like 18,000. <laughs> there's so many jobs, careers you can be. Do you follow me? So they're bewildered. It's like going in and do you want Rice Krispies or Corn Flakes? And they're like, do you want any of these hundreds of cereals? And they're like, and they're also told, wait, wait a sec. They're also told, you know, you've got to live your best life and it has to be everything. It's going to be amazing. And you could maybe be a social media influencer. And they're like, oh my God, it's going to be so amazing. Oh God, oh God. And there's so much pressure on them. And it's so kind of hard to know what they should do they're they're frozen in the face of college because they're like this is all so important and I have to live my best life and I don't know what to do and they don't have any sense of purpose and they don't have any sense of who they are they don't have an identity as such it's much more kind of vague and nebulous and it's very hard to pin down and I can see why they get fixated on an identity they get fixated on I'm I'm all about being non-binary or I'm I'm all about being just anything to get them something to handle, a handle on something because everything is so vague and it's all the the it's not singing to them. It's not they don't yeah. know, yeah, they don't really have any idea of where they're going. And I think that's very frightening. Well, before it was kind of stultifying because you were told you're going to college, you're gonna have a job. <laughs> And you're going to get married or whatever. And it was very narrow, but now it could be anything. And they're just going, I'm so frozen. I don't know where I'm going. When they come out of college, they're like, I just, I'm so scared because I could do anything and I don't want to, don't know what to do. It's very scary. I know that's you, complicated, but. Have you heard of Yonmi Park? She, Yonmi Park, she escaped from North Korea. And she right. wrote some books and I read both of her books recently. And in one of them, there's something fascinating that happened when she moved to America because she first escaped from North Korea to China and then South Korea. And then she made her way to America. And she said what happened when she arrived to America with the American culture is that there's so much stuff. Yeah. And, and because when she was in North Korea, she wasn't really a person. Okay, so she had to follow the regime and the regime doesn't humanize anybody in North Korea. So she had never had an opportunity to do things like choose what she wants to wear for the day or choose what to eat. And she said there's so much choice in America that it almost got to the point where she felt like she wanted other people to make all the choices for her Mm -hmm. because thinking about what she wants is too hard. That's exactly what I'm talking about. They're like, oh, my God, I have to choose my college and it's so important. And I don't know. I'm looking at all of them and I haven't a notion. Somebody somebody else do it and mommy and daddy will do it. And they'll say, this is what you have to do. And they'll go, OK. And it, yeah, but they shouldn't do it. They no, shouldn't. no, we're making a mess of things. And I really feel the teenagers. I know this is kind of depressing, but I wrote it to kind of give heart and hopefully let parents say, no, no I'm good enough the way I am in my own you know, flawed way. It's fine to be the way I am and to lean into it rather than whacking them off to psychotherapists like myself and just thinking, 
she's depressed. Do you follow me? There's something awful happening. And it's mental. <laughs> I know I sound awful slagging off my own industry and I, I, I very <laughs> reluctantly have come to this, but I've I've had a kind of extraordinary experiences in the last 10 years around mental health industry that I'm just thinking we're not doing it right. No, I mean, you're not. I'll tell you we're, why. We're really not. We're not doing it right. I uh, spoke on another podcast recently and it, I don't know how it came up, but I sort of let it slip that when I was 16, I got diagnosed with um, chronic depression by a GP and he gave me citalopram and I was on that till I was like 24 on and off I was abusing it as well because when you're a teenager you don't take responsibility and be consistent with medication yeah. you can't be trusted and that really I feel like that messed me up like totally it, yeah and I'm not against medication but I'm very at last resort very, I'm not against it yeah I'm not I'm against not it, it but yeah it, it's it's like the um to so many kids so many kids especially those an awful lot of kids who've, who've gone through gender issues and stuff like that so many of them started with antidepressants and things like that and you know it's wrecking their libido do you know what I mean it's wrecking their um um ability to fancy people and therefore their ability to think about other people you know what yeah. I mean? Which is what should be happening between 10 and 20, that you're starting to think not about myself, but about somebody else. And I need to brush up my social skills so that that person will fancy me. Yes. Back. You, all of that is gone because you've no libido. So you're just thinking me, 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 me. As one, of the, one of the weirdest things happened not too long ago, a few months ago, I was listening to Jordan Peterson. I don't know if you like him. He's I controversial. I love mm -hmm. him. And um, he said something about there's a correlation between people being unhappy and thinking about themselves. Yeah. That when he okay. had patients that were extremely unhappy and socially anxious, he encouraged them to go out of their way to make other people yeah. comfortable talking to them. And I was like, holy shit, I need to do that more. <laughs> like, yeah. And I'm a grown up and I'm like, I need to do oh, that yeah. more because that, that will impact how I feel about being around other people. Because I think obviously lockdowns have, and pandemic and everything had an impact on all of us yeah. in that way. And some of us just were all too willing, by the way, to forget how to be around each other in real life. We were more than happy to throw that away. And I don't think that that has helped. No. And you're right. And he's right. And like if somebody, imagine if you've got a five-year-old who's very anxious, who doesn't want to go to school or doesn't go into the, into the party, which is common. If you can get them thinking about how worried the kids are inside or how worried the mummy is about the cake inside, they will reduce their anxiety. If you can get somebody who's very anxious to think about and care about and empathize somebody else, their anxiety reduces because they start caring. Um, about, that's know. good advice. I'm going to use yeah. that on my nephew because he... Yeah. But I, I used a different tactic. So he was refusing to go to school one morning. So I video called him, I FaceTimed him um, and told him to go to school. I'm not going to come around and see him on the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> Hardcore. <laughs> but but that that him... other one's a good one at parties and things. Because yeah. sometimes the, you, you get like the loudest kid, my nephew, will retreat. Yeah. And it's, it's a party. You would expect him to be the one going. Mm. But sometimes they do retreat. And then maybe I'll think about that as some yeah. advice like go and see how the other kids are doing and I wonder if the mammy's worried about her cake because she was talking to me earlier and she said the cake wasn't proper and you know the birthday boy mightn't like the cake and god I wonder what it's like and if you get the kid buying in go really and is it that I don't know will we go in and check it out because I heard she's worried about it and you're kind of getting <laughs> them into the drama of something else is happening and it's not all about you now you have to do it very gently and I give kind of strategies around how a therapist would do it just so you know kind of like you know the wizard of oz is behind the green curtain i tried to kind of take away the green curtain and listen we're not doing anything extraordinary we've learned a few things we've learned ways and around human interaction and the more we impart that the more people could say yeah that would work that wouldn't it's like throwing darts you know this might work with one kid and this will work with another kid but frankly what the parent has to offer is love and commitment that very few therapists would be able to offer as much as and that's why the parents' place shouldn't be usurped by a therapist. You know? Yeah. Do you think, though, that parents are try like, do you think they get a little bit stumped and a little bit overwhelmed and they offload some of the responsibility onto a therapist to sort of like hand their kid over and be like, well, yeah. you, you can deal with this, all the bits I can't do. Thank you very yeah. much. Like, like, a, like a hired second parent, yeah. you know? 
I think society has taught parents that that's what they should do and that's good parenting. So I think they do it with the best, you know, um, motivation in the world. They're doing yeah. it because they think I'm brave enough to say I can't handle this. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. I get it. And sometimes the kid has such serious trauma that you do need to get some professional help. I get it. But sometimes, honestly, like I said at the beginning, you could read about it and impart it. Or you could get, you the parent could get coaching from a therapist. I think that's a really powerful thing to do. People don't really hear me when I say that. And I say, I honestly think that's stronger. You get the kind of the strategy so you can help your child. It's, it's a stronger way to go at it than, hey, you go in there. And I remember one teenager telling me, or one parent telling me that the teenager was something like 14 and she was told to listen to loud music in her room whenever she was stressed. And so four in the morning comes and music's pumping out of her bedroom and the ma comes in saying, turn it down. My therapist told me to listen to music when I'm stressed. And so, <laughs> do you know what I mean? You're disempowering yourself. You're putting yourself out of the picture when actually your kid needs it. They, they, need, they need your authority. They need your confidence. And you mightn't feel confident. And that's where you look for help elsewhere. But I think we've disempowered parents. I think we as a society have done it for like super nanny onwards. We have really disempowered parents. So we feel really insecure in our parenting. And at the same time, we've got this mental health industry breathing down our neck that if we don't keep our kids fat, happy at all times, they're going to have mental health issues. So, And then yeah. they might have a mental health issues. So we're frightened of the mental health issues. And it just becomes this mass of distress. I think the mental health um labels are thrown out too quickly like i said like even when i was 16 and the doctor said oh, chronic oh, yeah. depressed, i remember just sitting there thinking are you sure i'm not just a teenager like are you yeah. sure or, like do you remember I, thinking that yeah and and when i was in school as well that teacher said oh she's very moody you know and even the teachers were talking about like bipolar issues and I remember being like I'm 16 it, wow. a 16 year old's not normally moody I mean come on did, did he say chronic depression yeah chronic. he said chronic depression when I was 16 and I didn't really um here's what happens when somebody tells you something like that and you're young you give up yeah. on everything else you go oh well, i'm chronically depressed now i can't do yeah. anything yeah <laughs> that's oh, not true i wish somebody had just told me to i wish somebody just told me to get on with it like stop well, feeling sorry for yourself don't listen, to, don't listen to radiohead on loop for like two hours was, as jordan peter would say <laughs> but to a point because you've got to do it well because if you just say get on with it the, yeah you know it doesn't work you know, yeah, I, mean? I agree. So, so so you've got to do it carefully and you've got to think about it. And that's why I always tell parents, like when something like that comes in the door, something big, you pull back, you zip it, you educate yourself, you pull right back and you think I'm the project manager here. Imagine like the house is on fire. You're assessing everything. You're pulling back. So what is the right thing to do here? I need to take this actually very seriously. This is why I need to shut up and actually read about it and think quite seriously like these this really matters now and I, I speak a lot less and think a lot more and actually think of the quietness when everybody's gone out or you go out to the nature and you're thinking and you're walking and you're thinking what is the best way how would I advise my sister if she was in this trouble you know what I mean taking in other people's advice and other people's views of it then you act do you know what I mean because what we tend to do is like, oh, my God, quick, go, therapist. I need you now. I need you now. Doctors. Da, 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 da. And it's too fast. Or it's too soon. It's not. And you're on a train then. Once you're on the train, it's very hard to get off. And you're in a panic. I know a fire is in the head. I, I do know that. But it's it's so important that you have to do it kind of what's what's required as opposed to immediately into reactivity. So I, I think it is very frightening when a kid gets given a diagnosis. But it's very important that the parent thinks, I need to have a think about this before we figure out how we're going to handle this diagnosis. Because diagnoses are very, very satisfying. And they're also very, very burdensome on the brain. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm someone that thinks about stuff like that a lot. Like I have, I, I'm a grown up now, so this ain't even a childhood story. But I have, um, to, so 
I have a lot I have had a lot of anxiety symptoms I won't say I've got anxiety because I haven't been diagnosed with it and I don't particularly care to I have well, spent I just a lot jump of, in while you're saying that yeah I'm much more into the vibe of traits of anxiety traits of OD, a, OCD traits oh, I said symptoms as in you know like yeah symptoms traits rather than I am Yes, so that's why I said symptoms, and that helps me because if I, like I said earlier, when the doctor told me when I was 16 I had chronic depression, I gave up. I was like, well, I'm chronically depressed, I can't do anything, this is just it, and that is not true, and I've spent a lot of my adult life, especially since I got cancelled, that was big for me, um, the last three or four years, really working really hard on myself and this is something that's promoted a lot in our society but it's only talked about in a shallow way the same way mental health is talked about in a really shallow way people go oh mental health you know world mental health day and I've got anxiety and OCD and all these things that people say and they don't really mean it what they mean is that they have some days that are difficult for quite a few days at a time and some days that are not so difficult but maybe not overly satisfying but do you know what that's that's how a lot of life is and you've got to make this is really simplistic of me to say because I'm not a therapist and I know that there are more serious situations where this advice doesn't apply but one thing I keep trying to tell myself is to implement things throughout my day that rescue me does yeah. that make sense? To make me yeah. feel no, better. I've seen you. You and I are on Facebook together a long time together. But I've seen you do it. I've seen you. You you really kind of you 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 go at it. You attack it, and you're doing it like you can. I can see what you're doing, and it's somebody who's taken it seriously and who's kind of taken it on to make. As far as I can see, from what I see of what you know what I mean, you're taking it on, going for your run, or doing this, or measuring. You know what I mean. I can see where you're going with it, and it's exactly how one should do it. Do and it's not just saying? doing it once; it's consistent. Oh, I've got to do it every day. Yeah. So every day, if a cup of tea makes me happy. I schedule in a cup of tea, it sounds pathetic, but I have a to-do list every day. And every day, a cup of tea is scheduled in. Every yep. day, going to the gym is scheduled in. Every day, if I'm watching some, me and my friend have got like this really stupid thing where we watch Married at First Sight. It's the stupidest program, but we watch it and we text each other about it. And that is scheduled in because I that's something ask, that makes me happy. How did you learn that you had to do that? Because it's it's so key that you learned that because that's what we're trying to kind of teach the world as such. If you I follow. think I learned it from a long time of not doing things mm -hmm. like that for myself. So I don't put myself first. That's mm -hmm. something that's been really, really I've struggled with because I've never felt like I'm good enough and I've never felt like I'm clever enough and like everybody else is better than me um, because everybody else is a good person. That's why being cancelled really affected me because that was the first time I was confronted with hundreds of people telling me, hundreds of people that I knew in real life for a long time that know me um, saying that I'm a bad person. And I was like, well, I don't think I'm a bad person based on just not thinking that men are women and then it, it, it over the years it's propelled this thought system where I'm like well if I'm not a bad person because I don't think men are not women then I can't be a bad person in all of myself so there must be good in there somewhere and then I started to realize that I'm a good person in other ways and it's weird because I would never have said that out loud that I'm a good person because usually when somebody's saying oh, I'm a good person oh, they're yeah. saying it because they're not good right yeah. but it's it's something I've had to teach myself but I think it's because bad things continuously happen and I'm not learning how to deal with them properly so when I got cancelled I went into a really dark place and I was like I can't let first of all I can't let this happen and I'm not letting them send me down to hell in my head. Very good. I can't do it. And then um, obviously there's still, I still have bad times sometimes, but I'm, I'm dealing, I'm dealing with things. I'm dealing, sorry, I'm just grabbing something think, to think, fiddle with, hold on to. But I, think, I think from what you're saying, if I'm right, I, I think it's very interesting. It's because you kind of knew that you were right, which you were, that it kind of gave you strength to think they're wrong. 
I know they're wrong yeah. on this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but I never thought that before because I always yeah. thought everybody else was always right and I'm always yeah. wrong and I'm always... Yes. Because I never thought I was clever either. That's been a big thing my whole life. I've never thought I was clever. So everybody else knows something I don't. Yeah. And when I realised, well, hang on a minute, they, they don't know this. I know. This is... It's... It's been a process, though, and I think a lot of people are actually too scared to start a process like this, genuinely, with themselves, just quietly, not like going online and talking about it everywhere all the time, because that's bad, too, because I get easily obsessed with things. I can get obsessed with how I'm feeling or if I'm having a a really bad day, I get obsessed with that. So I'm trying not to do that. And I think that I forgot where I was going, <laughs> but, but yeah. basically people are scared. People are scared to go, to go into that. And they do a lot of talk online about mental health and I'm on a wellness mm. journey and I'm doing this and mm. I'm doing that. No, you're not. What you're doing is you're taking pictures of yourself that are heavily what? filtered, that look nice to give yourself a bit of satisfaction in that moment. You're not implementing a daily schedule around your work or around your family life you're not putting in rescue plans like one of my rescue plans if I'm really having a bad day is I ask if I can babysit the kids because they make me laugh so much and they That's make me so lovely. happy and even if I'm like at the end of two hours just like please take them back they're a nightmare but they do lift my spirits and it takes <laughs> me out of my own mind yeah and it, it, I'm putting somebody else before me I yeah. mean, obviously, I've got a partner, so I put him before me a lot as well. But it's there's something about there's children are. This is going to sound really weird, but children are really sort of like precious. I don't know if that's the word. And there's something in me that wants to protect them. And so when the nieces and nephews do come round, I would do anything for them. I'd like actually jump in front of a bus for them. And so when they're here, it's just such a relief for me to have that sort of like time with them. They're so funny. They make me laugh they're fun and I make them do work I make them do art I make them paint canvases I make them do all sorts of stuff and it's fun and it takes me out of myself for a minute does that make sense yeah and that's exactly how people need to attack their mental health and it's very hard to get whatever it is the strength inside you that you make yourself do it you've learned that you have to and what what sometimes we are in we're, we're getting in the way of remember I said the developmental task of teenager We're getting in the way of them learning that, no, you have to. You have to brave the anxiety of going into school because otherwise you'll just end up in a very lonely life. The the option is anxiety going into school, chronic loneliness. You've got to brave the the short term emotions. Do you know what I mean? We're we're not in a culture that says you have to. We're not in a culture. That's Mm -hmm. why we've got cancel culture, right? Because people will not put their neck on the line if they don't have to. I know. I know. It's not going well. It's not going no. well. I, I mean, how? I think there's going to be a backlash from all this. I think people. Are... Uh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and d- bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, I d- I've learned a lot about myself from being cancelled. I've learned that I'm much more of a fighter than I thought I was. Like, I'm definitely not scared to scrap about things. But I didn't know that about myself. And it's sad to imagine teenagers not learning things about themselves because there are things about you that are intrinsic that might be really useful. Yeah. I wish I'd known how much of a fighter I was when I was younger because I would have stood up for myself a lot sooner. Maybe it made you a fighter. Maybe it brought it out. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Could have. Yeah. There's been a lot of times in my life, though, I have not stood up for myself when I really should have. So I think it was um, maybe it was just a sort of this is the last time. This is the last time. You know, like that poem I said to you about earlier. Oh, yeah, it's beautiful. When he walks around the, the hole and then he walks on a completely different path. Yeah. That's, that's, that's how I feel. My autobiography in five verses. That's, that's it. Yeah, it's yeah. Beautiful. beautiful, really, really lovely. Do you think there is, because you said like it's all a bit uh, at the moment and oh, there's going to be a backlash and all this. I think so. Do you think there is a positive light coming through though? I do. Is there a light in the cracks? I think history shows us again and again and again 
that we go too far east as west and we swing back and we swing back and we swing back and we're swinging like we we've gone too puritanical we've got too kind of censoring and you know we we've we've really got kind of lost the run of ourselves and i think there's going to be and it's joyless you know what i mean there's a, there's a joylessness and there's a lack of of wildness wildness it's very constrained everybody's very tight and there's an awful lot of anxiety i think there's uh, some level of a of a you know the the equivalent of a punk revolution coming some some sort of pushback yeah. of, and it'll come hopefully sooner than later and hopefully it'll be just kids who are over just... sooner than later as well <laughs> get yeah. it over and done with yeah, i mean i think maybe teenagers are feeling that as well and there isn't like you were saying earlier like there's not like youth clubs and things they can go to and I feel like there's not really a culture for them either there's not a teenage culture that's a really good one like I listen to a lot of um, music when I'm in the gym so yeah. I've caught on to a lot of the young people music I feel like I can say that now because I'm like over a certain age caught on to a lot of the young people music and I listen to it and I love their music it's good yeah. you know all the all the boys with the tattoos all over their faces okay, right, I, li yeah. I listen to all them and but their lyrics are so depressing all the time and I know we had depressing lyrics when I was growing up but this right. is sort of like existential stuff this is and some of it is not I mean there, there's some of it's not like that but there's a lot of that sort of um what's the point sort of going on Okay. in their generation like what what yeah. is what is this why are we here and i just think that is actually a really good opportunity for teenagers to get philosophical and to really dive yeah. into thinking about things but i don't well, know maybe they don't want to have to think oh no i think they do like that's one thing i go into in the book like i do, i say you know meet their hunger for depth an awful lot of kids are really into it when i go deep with them they're really kind of i never thought of that before I'm really interested. They want those deep conversations. And an awful lot of parents are afraid to go deep because they're afraid of all sorts of mental health and they're afraid to go deep because they think it's heavy. And I'm like, the teenagers are crying out for some depth. It's a very vacuous life. It's full of distraction and it's a bit empty. And you can quickly feel like, what's the point? I'm anxious, I'm scared and life is boring and it's all admin and what's the point? And the more you can go deep, the more it's like, wow, there is a point. You can get really excited by the mind. You know, there's so much out there. So, yeah, I'm really into that. I, I like the idea, but I think kids should be listening to sad music on some level. Yeah, yeah. So long as it's bringing about thought and a kind of an, an acknowledgement of, of the strangeness of life and of the difficulty of life and how you can also have, you know, you, you knock fun out of it yourself. Well, I'm obviously not against it because I'm like in my mid thirties and I'm listening to their music while I'm in the gym. <laughs> so I'm not <laughs> against it. I just um I know how powerful that sort of stuff is when you're young and I don't know what the teenage culture really is right now. It feels like it's there it's just lots and lots of things all all in one. Whereas there when I was a teenager there was like genres, like if you liked um, all sort of like Blink 182 and all the punk pop music going on. You you weren't in the group of people that listened to Britney Spears. Do you know what I mean? Oh, there yeah. was that. Yeah. So there was, but that in a way, that is kind of like the gender identity thing that's going on, right? Because if you're yeah. in the trans and the non binary, you're not in the cisgender. So. I know. It's not really working out at all, really, the way the way they're doing it. But I think in fairness to the, the, the gender issue, I think they're looking for depth. They're looking for a framework. They're looking for very often they're looking for life isn't fair. There must be somebody who's at wrong, who, somebody to blame. <laughs> And we must have a better way of living. So it happened in, you know, the hippie culture in the 1960s. And the young people said, this isn't right. You know, all this war, you know, what about love? Give peace a chance. And there was this huge movement of youth people who were trying to make a better world, you know, and it really went everywhere. And God bless them. You know, it was kind of a beautiful idea what they had. It didn't really go very well. An awful lot of them ended up kind of addicted to drugs the music was amazing and the films were amazing and the books were very good but I'm not sure if if it kind of got very far other than it left a great legacy of the mind 
if you follow me again, I think, you know, that some of it was really amazing. The thoughts and some of the songs and stuff were beautiful. This time they're doing the same thing. They're saying, this is all wrong. There's so much unfairness. But I think their conclusion isn't as inspiring because it's like they're the oppressors, down with them, beat them. It's very aggressive and brutal. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, go to war, go to war on them. <laughs> it's, 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 it's but, something to fight for, isn't it? Yeah. So in, in the peace and love, they were fighting for peace and love. This time they're fighting the oppressor. And basically the oppressor is anybody who disagrees with us and who anybody who might be kind of doing well in life, if you follow me. But I, I think the mentality behind it is trying to get a better life, trying to get a better world, trying to create. I think it is. Now, other people would argue, you know, there might be very nefarious people way behind that. But the average 15 year old who falls into kind of that type of thinking, they're thinking that the world is filled with oppressors and victims and they want to be on the side of the victims and help the victims and the oppressors bring them down. I think that's kind of. I think that's why uh, someone like Jordan Peterson is really popular because he's giving people instructions, like young men mainly, instructions yeah. like if you want a better life, do these things, you know, like sort of t- clean your bedroom, <laughs> tidy your bedroom and mm-hmm. maybe get a job. And if you don't he- like the job, you keep that job till you find one you do like and you yeah. build this life and you do these things. And I think that speaks to that but I think that is also why there's a lot of pushback on him because I think people don't want to hear that no they don't want to hear it they want to hear it's all somebody's fault it's the slightly rich guys and it's them and they are ruining our lives it's so simplistic to think like that because actually when you think about it we don't know where we've come from we don't know where we're going we don't know why some people have terribly tragic lives and some people have an easy time of it. we don't know any of it it's existentially very difficult to live you know happy you know i remember somebody saying to me well if you're any way sensitive in life you must be distressed on a regular basis <laughs> yes <laughs> yes isn't that isn't that somewhat normal as well yes like it's got yeah. to be well, you'd have to be pretty insensitive not to be distressed, was his point. And I, I thought it was a great point, it's, yeah. It's a weird thing to be born and to be here and to be, like, a human. It is a weird thing. It's, oh, it's very like, weird. What the fuck? Yeah. How did this happen? I, why, I, why did this happen? And what I encourage this? parents to go like, in there rather than stay in the child, like, oh, cheer up, it will be okay. Go into the weirdness of... It is very hard. And the child between 10 and 20 is having a reckoning of this is mad. We've no idea where we're going. We've no idea why some people are looking. We've no idea of any of this. Yeah. I mean, that's why. It's brilliant, too. There is a lot of brilliance in it. I think that's why you get the thing that I said when I was a teenager that I thought was like so deep and powerful and unique. And it's not every teenager says, I didn't ask to be born. I hate my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's that I didn't ask to be born. I thought it was such a powerful thing. Ah. Like, I didn't ask to be born. I'm just here. And it's your fault I'm here. <laughs> like, there is something in it. We didn't ask for you to be born, did we? <laughs> and then it's like to move it on and say, well, no, you didn't. Nobody did. And also, you know, and you didn't. Fair enough. Fair enough. You know, you could knock fun out of life from now on. Now you've landed here, you know. <laughs> it's like you're on an airplane. You might as well enjoy it. Yeah, you're here. You might as well do something. Yeah, you might as well knock some fun out of it. That's your challenge, you know. I think so. I think as well, like, do you think in your book, are there points where you talk about teenagers um Go, like going into adulthood and how they can sort of like navigate that with a purpose. Yeah, I try. One of the chapters is about looking for purpose, meaning kind of looking for a purpose rather than looking for happiness and trying to avoid distress. You'd be better off looking for purpose and meaning. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because that's actually going to get you so much further. You know, not, not, Don't worry about avoiding distress. You won't. You'd be better off just looking for a bit of depth, a bit of meaning, a bit of purpose, and you'll feel much more settled in yourself. You know? Yeah, it reminds me of um, my my fellow, he's obviously a musician, and one of his songs, 
he's got the line, um, they told us we could be whatever we want to be, but the problem is we don't know what we want to be. Mm. And I think that speaks to it, you know, that sort of, and I think everybody, not everybody, but a lot of people go through that, not knowing what they want to be, not quite knowing where they're going to go yeah. next. And and some people like me or my fella, we've gone through it at different times in our lives as well. Like like being cancelled, it's like, oh, what next? Like, who am I? What am I doing? Like, what shall I do? And you've got to learn to deal with that. And the only way you can learn to deal with that is to go through it, right? You've got to go through it. Yeah. And that's what the teenagers need to do. They need to kind of go through, and it's hard on them. I, th- I think it's a hard, a hard reckoning that happens. And I think it's all right to be distressed. And if if the kid can have some sort of sense of purpose about what they want, they're better off than any exams or anything like that. Do you know what I mean? Some sort of vibe of what they want. Yeah. Thanks a million for speaking with me, Birdie. It's been very <laughs> That's all right. Can yeah. I ask you, like, because yeah. we're going to wrap it up in a moment, yeah. can I ask you what your book is called? Because we've done oh, this yeah. whole episode without even... I think I said it at the beginning. Don't worry. What your teen is trying to tell you. <laughs> yes, you did tell me. Thank Yay. you very much. It's like, a, it's like a, you've made it sound like a book, with like a uh, um, cracking a code book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm I kind of it's not a book that you need to read not many people will read it from cover to cover it's more dipping in because it's different issues like eating or eating disorders or or OCD or anxiety or or you know meaning and purpose so it's kind of looking at, it's it's a book you dip into it wouldn't be a book so if your kid is kind of cracking up about one the school refusal or whatever you'd go to that section and presumably read around the psychology around that in that section so that's that's how I've structured it Okay, well, thank you very much for talking with me. Um, I'm gonna end. That. I'm gonna end this episode. But, okay. Um, would you mind sticking around for a couple of minutes while I like, ask no you bother. something? No bother. Thank you. Early in the morning, as the sun comes up, I just wanna have a cup. There's one drink. That's the one for me. Won't you please make me a cup of